and welcome to In Parliament. I'm Sharon Tong. Parliament has kicked off its debate on Budget 2013. 27 members of Parliament spoke on the first day. Many lauded the inclusiveness of the budget with its bold moves to bring about income equality. They also noted that it was a budget which had Singaporeans and Singaporean workers at the core of its measures. Many speakers also acknowledged that the measures showed that the government has taken ground sentiments into account. Rather than to term this as a Robin Hood budget, as some analysts have said, I would prefer to describe this as a budget that values every worker, from the rank and the file to the professionals, managers and executives, PMEs for short. This is not just about simply taxing the rich and distributing to the lower income. This is about a budget that has set aside specific long-term resources to help different groups of workers at different life stages. For an inclusive society, if we only take steps to mitigate income inequalities, especially for the lower and middle income group, without quality growth and without building capability of, of all Singaporeans and having quality jobs, this will not be sustainable. Growth and quality growth is absolutely necessary. While growth is important, Singaporeans must also feel that we can actively participate and benefit from this growth in areas of opportunities, jobs, real income, and more importantly, well-being. It is important that we recognize that it is precisely the concerns of having or not having the chance to actively participate in the growth and benefiting from it that is causing angst that we're hearing many express. I'm heartened by the series of measures that built on previous year's efforts to bridge income gaps and promote social mobility towards a more inclusive society. This year's budget has been even more progressive, with wide-ranging measures to help lower-income groups move up the ladder and also a larger tax liability for the affluent on luxury homes, investment properties and high-end cars. The government has made a concerted effort to address inequality in this budget. This year's budget strikes me as a progressive and compassionate one. Like several MPs in this House, I'm heartened that the government is taking the right steps towards building a fair and inclusive society and addressing some of the concerns of Singaporeans, such as the rising cost of living, the need to reduce income inequality, and recognizing that meritocracy alone is insufficient to sustain social mobility in Singapore. And to give companies time to restructure and adjust to these measures, the government introduced a transition package for them. Central to this package is the wage credit scheme, which was the focus of quite a number of MP speeches. While many law must upgrade, many have asked what happens after three years. The point is transition needs time, but we must transition. We must upgrade. Otherwise, with wage increases, they will not be able to sustain the additional cost. And if not, they will go out of business and jobs will be lost. So I cannot reiterate this enough. Getting the balance right will be crucial. To ease the pain of transition, the budget is packed with sweeteners to help companies, including a generous three-year transition support package, especially targeted to help SMEs. I urge SMEs to step up organize themselves and leverage the available schemes as much and as quickly as they can in order to take their businesses to higher levels of productivity and competitiveness. SMEs are the backbone of our economy and key providers of jobs. This restructuring must result in a revitalized SME sector that is strong and vibrant for the sake of Singapore's future. Another thrust of the transition package for companies was the enhancement to the Productivity and Innovation Credit Scheme. Non-constituency MP Yi Jen Jong says smaller companies will benefit from the enhancement, which he called generous. PIC is given a new push with the new one-for-one -one top up grant of $5,000 per year. It is a generous payout over and above the earlier PIC payouts. I think this will get more smaller companies to use PICs as they will get more cash than what they have invested. The PIC process is relatively easy to administer. 
compared to most other government grant schemes. While PIC is useful to provide some relief to companies, it is limited in effectiveness for some types of companies who really need a major transformation. And it's not always automation that will help companies restructure. Sometimes it requires drastic change, changes to business processes, organization structure, and to business models. And several Labour MPs highlighted that a strong tripartite partnership was what has helped businesses restructure. They reiterated the need to upgrade the skills of workers. I submit that our PMEs should better equip themselves in this uncertain global economic landscape by second skilling and preparing themselves so that they can fall back on their second skill to stay employed and employable in the event of any economic downturn. In tandem with incentives for companies to restructure, Budget 2013 introduced a further tightening on the inflow of the foreign labour workforce. But Dr Amy Kaur, who is the Minister of State for Manpower, warned of repercussions to cutting foreign worker numbers too quickly. While cognizant of the social downside of having a large number of foreign workers, if the pace of change is too hurried, for example, by freezing the foreign worker growth immediately, as some are championing, the consolidation may be too drastic and the job losses due to company failures, many of which are owned by Singaporeans, may be irreparable. The ultimate victim may be the Singaporean worker. Hence, the government has chosen to adopt a calibrated approach to the tightening of the foreign worker policy. The government would also continue to do all it can to grow our local workforce and improve our labour force participation rate for older workers and economically inactives through various programmes and incentive schemes. Nonetheless, it must be noted that our total labour force participation rate is already one of the highest in the world and in fact higher than many OECD countries. Our male labour force participation rate at 75.6% in 2011 for those aged 15 and above is in fact higher than that of Sweden's at 73.9%. Hence, over time, raising the labour force participation rate will have its limits. Several MPs asked for more measures to make sure companies put Singaporeans first in their hiring policies. Singaporeans are asking that the government impose more restrictions on SPAS and EP workforce. The fact is that these jobs command a higher salary and they are being sought after by PMET citizens with better education. Singaporeans are naturally upset when their employers terminate their services and replace them with foreign workers on EP or SPAS simply because these foreign workers are less expensive. We should give Singaporeans the opportunities to take up these middle management positions and to develop their careers from there. Like my colleague Mr Patrick Tay, I urge the government to make it a criteria that any business that wishes to employ a foreigner on an employment pass or S pass must prove that they have advertised and cannot find a suitable Singaporean to take up the job. Salary cannot and should not be the main criteria. Even as we remain open to foreigners who can contribute to our economy, add diversity to our perspective, and transfer useful skills and knowledge, and even though we do not want to shield ourselves artificially from overseas competition, we should not allow discriminatory practices against Singaporeans in our own backyard. Moreover, our universities and polytechnics produce high quality graduates and diploma holders, and many Singaporeans study and excel in top universities overseas. By safeguarding fair employment opportunity for Singaporeans, we will be better placed to build up a core of highly competent Singaporean professionals who can in time become captains of our own industry. Some members of parliament also called for more ways to encourage the economically inactive to rejoin the workforce. One group highlighted was women and there were suggestions for family-centric work policies to be introduced to help women who want to return to work. And they say enhancements to work policies won't just benefit employees but also employers. The government should consider extending back-to-work employment credit scheme offering up to 30 to 50 percent of wage subsidy depending on wage levels to employers who hire women returning to the workforce for up to a year. 
This will help employers offset the cost for on-the-job training for these women as they, re as they reintegrate back to the workforce as well as any necessary redesign of work arrangements. Employers themselves enjoy access to a large and diverse talent pool of employees as well as greater loyalty from staff. It is about being family and employee centric, caring and nurturing. Those ingredients make a company grow and make the workplace family friendly. What is needed is a comprehensive approach that encompasses flexible working options, training, innovative recruitment and support in childcare to create an environment conducive for families and biz businesses to flourish in. The other group was older workers. Labour MP Heng Chi Hao called on the government to initiate tripartite discussions to evaluate the progress of the re-employment law, which came into effect in January last year, in particular to consider how soon and best to further extend the re-employment age ban from the current 62 to 65 years to 62 to 67 years. MP David Ong also called on the government to remove the mandatory retirement age and to reconsider paying economically active, elderly, fair and equitable wages. I made this call because of the tight labour market, the need to slow down the net inflow of foreign manpower, the need for companies to preserve experience and expertise, the improved health profile of succeeding cohorts of older workers, and the request from older workers to further facilitate their continued employment where they wish to do so and can continue to work. I call upon the government to indicate the time frame to start this discussion. One of my residents, Madam Ku, age 64, with a certificate in nursing care and a certified service professional, is eager to work in the healthcare industry. She tried repeated, repeatedly to get a job but was unsuccessful. In her own words, prospective employers do not give her a chance for an interview when they learn of her age. She now works as a cleaner because she, has to, she needs a job to make ends meet. With improved health and nutrition, our seniors today are fitter and stronger. They are ready solution uh, in our tight labour economy, instead of an over-reliance on foreign workers. The spotlight was also on another key thrust of Budget 2013, which centred on inclusive growth. Measures were put in place to promote social mobility from the ground up, and that is by providing quality preschools that is affordable and accessible. How we work towards building up such a culture could either involve tapping on the synergy generated by private public initiatives, such as that by the welfare organization Care Corner, to give disadvantaged children access to high quality preschool education, or by subsidies, or by going the broad way and nationalizing preschool education altogether. The main objective in any one of these options is to level the playing field. One way of looking at this recommendation that preschool education could conceivably be nationalized would simply be to see it as an extension of the educative years in our schools. Concerns over the rising cost of living was also covered. Several MPs said there was a need to help Singaporeans with health care costs, in particular for the older generation. They gave the thumbs up for the measures which help not only their low income, but those who are in the sandwich class as well. Many called for the government to do more to help Singaporeans achieve their aspirations. I received frequent feedback from residents expressing their fear that no matter how hard they work, their income will not be able to catch up with the escalating cost of living. Chief among their concerns will be the cost of medical care, cost of housing, cost of food, and even the cost of cars. At the end of the day, many Singaporeans ask, has my life become better than it was five or ten years ago? Is this a better Singapore? A resident I met recently on one of my blog visits, Uncle Robert, lamented that he hopes to be able to utilise his Medisafe funds for his medical health checks. He shared that although he was asked by his doctor to go for further checks at the hospital, he says that he has been postponing it as he was certain one check would lead to another and a final bill would be quite substantial for him for out-of-pocket cash payment. As a retiree, he said that he did not want to burden his children by asking them for money for his medical checks. But he added that he has several thousand dollars in his Medisafe account if only he could use it for his medical expenses. I foresee Singaporeans 
trying their whole lives to have adequate retirement savings by perhaps taking on a second job to put aside more money for their retirement to supplement their CPF savings for a better retirement income. If the high cost of living persists and are not addressed today, it will escalate into a bigger problem, but that is difficult to reverse in 20 to 30 years down the road, especially if inflation gets the better of any wage increases. Cost of living affects everyone. Low-income families especially will be hardest hit by any price movement, no matter how small, because they do not have any margin for error when budgeting for living expenses. A trip to the doctor, a rise in renter, an increase in food prices, or even a day of medical leave could spell trouble for this family. And looking at the latest report on wages, we have about 186,000 people earning $800 and below. I urge the government to look into improving their lives as we restructure our economy. Taxes have also been made more progressive, but was it enough? Some MPs had differing views. While I agree that taxes should get more progressive, we should do it carefully and avoid a loss of competitiveness. Many companies decide on where to locate their high-value hubs based on where their most valuable staff want to live. This applies to our high-end Singaporeans too, especially the young ones who are also very mobile. Taxes are not the key consideration, and rightly so, but unfortunately they are not irrelevant. We should ideally have a marginal taxes at the top end. However, there is a reality of Hong Kong which caps income tax at 15% effective tax rate for the highest income brackets. Therefore, I urge the Ministry to study any progressive taxation initiative carefully uh, before implementing them. I acknowledge the government's attempts in this budget to introduce further progressivity into our tax system and its focus on targeted help, which will go some way to mitigate the inequalities faced by Singaporeans. What is of utmost concern to most Singaporeans is worry over the rising cost of living. This should give us greater incentive to have more progressive taxes, which will reduce the need to raise other kinds of taxes which increase the overall cost of living, such as the GST. In this regard, I urge the government to continue to look at ways to introduce more progressivity into our tax system for the well-being of our society and the nation as a whole. Related to cost of living are property prices. Several MPs raised concerns over rising property prices and competition with foreign investments. They suggested the government look to existing policy frameworks in other countries as examples of how to curb foreign speculation of property. In Australia, all acquisitions of residential real estate by foreign interests require prior foreign investment approval. The Australian model essentially allows foreigners to buy new developments while restricting their subsequent sale to Australian residents at a price they can reasonably afford. We can institute this double prevention model in Singapore as it both tempers investment demand and restricts the resale incentive. I will also like to point the attention towards measures in large, larger land-rich neighbouring country, Malaysia, where properties below 500,000 ringgit are reserved for Malaysians only. This ensures the quantum of monies competing for normal houses is not unlimited. In other words, it is competition of equals, at least in some way. Further, to avoid foreigners from speculating, we could impose to ensure foreign buying, a foreigner buying a property cannot avail any loans from Singapore banks. This would mean leveraging will not fuel the speculation in the proper sector. The affordability of cars was also brought up. With the measures which will result in car buyers paying more upfront cash and higher premiums for cars, many MPs suggested introducing a needs-based system for cars. They said subsidies can be offered to first-time buyers or buyers who have young children or elderly folk living with them. For public transport, though, MP for Pasiris Pungol GRC, Janil Puticheri, had a radical suggestion to reduce the crush of peak hour travel. Currently on the MRT, a discount is offered to incentivize people to travel early. Instead, why not offer a window period where commuters can travel for free? If we can afford it, have all travel on public transport until the start of peak hour as free. If that's too great a leap, then maybe, for an example, every 30 minute, for a 30-minute minute window or an hour ending at 7.45 a.m., the commuters travel for free. Will this distort behavior? 
Yes, absolutely. It will distort behavior. That's the whole point. This will attract more people to change their travel patterns than any discount. It will be far more effective than any discount. Money has been budgeted for demand management. Why not channel the money that is being put aside into just giving free rides during that, a window period? Instead of using the money to conduct a complex research study, instead of using the money to create and maintain smartphone apps or generating programs with rewards and free gifts that we really don't need, just channel all the money directly into free travel and consumers and commuters will benefit from it. Everyone will benefit. Those that travel earlier will benefit from free travel. Those that can't will have less congestion and be more comfortable. Before the budget debate got underway, Parliament tackled question time with a focus on the workforce. Acting Minister for Manpower Tan Chuan Jin said the government's focus is to look after the interest of all working Singaporeans. He outlined two broad issues for his ministry to tackle in the long term. Firstly, how to raise the capabilities of Singaporeans. And secondly, how the country calibrates its work pass framework to ensure that foreign workers complement and not just substitute Singaporeans. Mr Tan was responding to a question question filed by MP for Ang Mokyo GRC Yo Guat Kwang, who asked what the government was doing to ensure that the Singaporean core will not be eroded during an economic downturn or during significant downsizing of companies. Mr Tan said in previous downturns, employers have cut back more sharply on foreign manpower compared to local manpower. He added the government had also started programs like the Skills Program for Upgrading and Resilience and the Jobs Credit Scheme to help workers stay employed. These are tools in our toolbox uh, that we can draw on, or variants of that as the case may be, uh, depending on the economic situation in the years to come. But I think the most important point to emphasize really is that the best way to ensure that Singaporean workers, Singaporean PMEs remain, remain meaningfully employed is to really to make sure that our, employ, our economy remains healthy and vibrant, and that Singaporeans are also equipped with the right attitude and aptitudes and skills. The debate on Budget 2013 resumes tomorrow. Good night.